모든 국민은 인간으로서의 존엄과 가치를 가지며 행복을 추구할 권리를 가진다. 국가는 개인이 가지는 불가침의 기본적 인권을 확인하고 이를 보장할 의무를 진다. 대한민국 사법부는 국민의 기본적 인권과 정당한 권리 행사를 보장하고 이를 통해 자유, 평등, 정의를 실현할 사명을 국민으로부터 엄숙히 부여받았습니다. 격동의 역사 속에서도 대한민국 사법부는 국민의 자유와 권리를 최대한 보장하고 소수자와 약자의 권리를 보호하는 최후의 보루로서 그 소임을 다하여 왔습니다. 대한민국 미래사법의 청사진을 제시하기 위하여 2014년 사법정책연구원이 출범하였습니다. 대한민국 사법부의 명실상부한 싱크탱크 사법정책연구원 사법정책연구원은 현실과 예상, 실무와 이론을 아우르는 체계적인 연구를 통해 미래의 사법부가 추구해야 할 바람직한 모습을 제시하고 있습니다. 국내를 넘어 세계를 향해 도약하는 사법정책연구원. 연구원은 대한민국 사법부의 싱크탱크입니다. 국제적 기준에 맞추어 우리 사법의 미래를 구상하고 사법제도의 개선을 위하여 노력하고 있습니다. 대한민국 사법부는 투명한 절차와 공정한 결과를 통해 국민이 수긍하고 감동하는 좋은 재판을 해나갈 것입니다. 이를 위해 사법정책연구원은 새 사회의 흐름에 부응하는 새로운 사법 정책과 제도를 연구함으로써 국제적 수준에 걸맞은 사법 정책을 제시하겠습니다. 미래를 여는 사법 정책 연구원. 굿 모닝 디스팅기스 게스트. Welcome to the 2020 JPRI International Conference. I'm Dr. Hyo Jung Kim, a professional researcher of JPRI. It is a great honor and a privilege for me to be a master of this international conference. This conference is co-hosted by Hague Conference on Private International Law, HCCH, the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, UNIDROI, and the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, UNCITRA. And this conference is sponsored by the Korean Bar Association, Korea International Trade Law Association, Korea Private International Law Association, and Association of Judges for International Commercial Law Studies. Under the big theme of international commercial litigation, recent developments, and future challenges, this conference will be dealing with the five topics, modernizing and harmonizing of international commercial contracts, secure transactions and insolvency, recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments, international commercial court and electronic litigation, and enforcement of arbitral award and settlement agreements resulting from mediation. They're both offline and online. 
I'm sure that this international conference will serve as a venue for in-depth discussions on the international commercial litigation by the prominent experts from all around the world. On behalf of the organizers of the conference, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of our distinguished guests for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us. And my special thanks go to the Secretaries General of the three organizations and also to their officials. I really appreciate for the time and efforts that these co-hosting organizations have exerted in order to make this international conference successful, even despite under the COVID-19 pandemic situation. I would also like to welcome the people who are joining us today over YouTube. We are broadcasting the whole conference live on YouTube Judicial Policy Research Institute channel for the people who are not here in person. This conference will provide simultaneous interpretation service for the convenience of multinational participants. So please take your receiver, which is available at the distribution desk at the lobby, and select the language according to your preference. Please ch select channel one for Korean and channel two for English. As a measure for COVID-19, I would like to ask you to wear a mask for a, your safety. If you need an extra mask, please inquire at the registration desk. And those of you who are in the floor can only enter your questions via your mobile devices. You can have access to the online Q&A session directly by scanning a QR code, which is displayed on the banners located at the front of our conference room. Now, I hereby declare the 2020 JPRI International Conference open. I would like to invite the president of JPRI, Ki Tae Hong, the host of this event, to deliver his opening remarks. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Myung Soo Kim, the Honorable Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Mr. Taek Lo, Justice of the Supreme Court, Mr. Chang Hee Lee, President of the Korean Bar Association, Dr. Christoph Bernasconi, Secretary General of the Hague Conference on Private International Law, Professor Tirado, Secretary General of the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, Ms. Anna Julian Barrett, Secretary of the uh, United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, all of whom I admire, and as well as to all the prominent guests from home and abroad for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us here today. It is a great honor for me to be able to, able to host this international conference on the main theme of international commercial litigation, recent developments and future challenges in cooperation with the HCCH, the UNIDROD, and UNCITROL. We feel fortunate and grateful to be able to jointly host an international event through both offline and online with the three organizations that boast authority and expertise in the field of private international law in these challenging times over uh, of COVID-19. Without active cooperation and interest of these three international organizations, we certainly would not have been able to host this event today. Therefore, I'm particularly thankful for the Secretaries General of the three organizations and to their officials. I'd also like to express gratitude to the Korean Bar Association, the Korea International Trade Law Association, the Korea Private International Law Association, and the Association of Judges for International Commercial Law Studies. Thank you for your active participation and support. We have come to host this conference with much more plentiful content. As you may know, with the breakthroughs in transportation, telecommunications, and scientific technology in our modern society, an innumerable variety of international trade such as business to business, B2C, C2C, and new forms of business relations are being created even at this very moment. 
Active international trade is also an affluent and vibrant source of our lives that we enjoy. However, unlike domestic uh, transactions, there are always uh, seeds of disputes in international trade that goes beyond time and place, in languages and borders, with risk of uh, minor misunderstandings causing major disputes. This is why broadened and deepened discussions are needed on the international commercial litigation as a way to resolve international trade disputes. In this light, uh, this international conference will deal with five topics, modernizing and harmonizing of international commercial contracts, secure transactions and insolvency, recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments, international commercial court and electronic litigation, and finally, recognition and enforcement arbitral award and settlement agreements resulting from mediation followed by presentations, discussions, and final plenary session. We hope that this international conference will serve as a stepping stone to look at the past and present of international commercial litigation and to design its path forward. Going forward, the Judicial Policy Research Institute uh, will commit to further efforts to studying and researching international commercial litigation. Once again, I'm deeply indebted to all the prominent guests from both home and abroad for their attendance in this difficult situation, to all the experts for their willingness to participate uh, in uh, the moderations, presentations, and discussions in this conference, despite their hectic schedules, and to all the officials for their efforts in putting together this conference. Thank you. Thank you, President Hong. It was an inspiring speech. This time, we are going to watch welcoming address video message delivered by the Honorable Chief Justice of Supreme Court of Korea, Myung Soo Kim. Let's take a look. Dongyeonghaneun, 내외 기빈 여러분. 오늘 대법원사나 사법정책연구원이 해외국 국제사법회의, 사법 통일을 위한 국제연구소, UN 국제상거래법 위원회와 함께. 국제 컨퍼런스를 개최하게 된 것을 대단히 기쁘게 생각합니다. 아울러 이번 행사를 후원해 주신 대한 변호사협회, 국제거래법학회, 한국국제사법학회, 대법원 국제거래법 연구회는 물론 세계 각국에서 원격으로 참석하시는 전문가 여러분께도 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 오늘날 전 세계의 연간 무역 규모는 약 40조 달러 정도이고 많은 사람들의 일상생활은 국제 거래와 밀접하게 연결되어 있습니다. 이러한 활발한 국제 교류 덕택에 세계 경제는 꾸준히 성장하고 있고 많은 사람들이 이전보다 더 풍요로운 생활을 누리고 있습니다. 앞으로도 국경을 넘어선 무역 규모는 날로 더 커질 것이고 이에 따라 국제 거래와 관련한 분쟁이 늘어나고 그 양상 또한 복잡해질이라 예상합니다. 이번 국제 컨퍼런스에서 국제 상사 소송의 발전과 미래라는 큰 주제 아래 국제 상사 소송의 현재 모습과 더욱 발전할 미래 모습에 관해 함께 논의하는 것은 국제 거래의 지속적인 발전을 위해 큰 의미가 있다고 생각합니다. 이번 국제 컨퍼런스에서는 국제 상사 계약의 현대화와 조화, 담보부 거래 및 도산, 외국 재판의 성인과 집행, 국제 상사 법원과 전자 소송, 중재 및 조정의 승인과 집행이라는 다섯 개 주제를 다룬 다음 종합 토론과 좌담회가 뒤따를 예정입니다. 국제 거래와 관련한 법규범을 통일하려는 노력과 그동안의 성과를 되돌아보고 전문가 여러분의 소중한 경험과 지혜를 공유하는 값진 시간이 될 것으로 기대합니다. 최근 사법정책연구원에서는 국제 상사 법원에 관한 연구와 외국 재판의 승인과 집행에 관한 연구라는 제목의 연구 보고서를 발간하였습니다. 이번 국제 컨퍼런스에 참여하신 많은 분들께서 참조할 만한 가치가 있는 보고서라고 생각합니다. 귀한 시간을 내어 이번 국제 컨퍼런스에 참여하신 모든 분들께 대한민국 사법부를 대표하여 다시금 깊은 감사의 말씀을 올립니다. 잠시 후 진행될 토론에서 유익하고 의미 있는 시간을 가지기를 기원합니다. 끝으로 행사 준비에 힘쓴 사법정책연구원장님을 비롯한 관계자 여러분과 공동주최기관인 새 국제기구의 관계자 여러분께도 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 감사합니다.
Thank you. 예, 감사합니다. 김명수 대법원장님께서 따뜻한 격려의 말씀을 해 주셨습니다. 여러분 모두 이번 컨퍼런스에서 유익하고 의미 깊은 시간 되시기 바랍니다. 자, 그럼 다음은 이찬희 대한변호사협회장님을 모시고 축사를 듣도록 하겠습니다. 이 회장님께서 오늘 이 자리에서 직접 함께 하지는 못하셨지만 녹화 영상을 보내주셨습니다. 자, 동영상을 시청해 주시기 바랍니다. 안녕하십니까. 대한변호사협회장 이찬희 변호사입니다. 국제상사소송의 발전과 미래를 조망하는 국제컨퍼런스를 축하드리며 뜻깊은 자리에 초대해 주셔서 감사합니다. 오늘의 컨퍼런스를 준비해 주신 존경하는 김명수 대법원장님, 노태학 대법관님, 홍기태 사법정책연구원장님, 그리고 바쁘신 중에도 소중한 시간을 내시어 이 자리를 빛내주신 모든 분들께 감사의 인사를 올립니다. 21세기에 이르러 국가와 기업들의 교류가 전 세계를 무대로 더욱 활발해지고 있습니다. 국가 간 직접적인 무력 충돌 대신 관세 부과 및 기술 보호의 법제화 등으로 외교 갈등의 양상이 변화하면서 국제 무역의 중요성 역시 날로 주목받고 있습니다. 특히 올해는 신종 코로나 바이러스 감염증 사태로 세계 각국이 자국 산업을 보호하기 위해 통상 장벽을 구축하는 등 글로벌 통상 환경 또한 시시각각 달라지고 있는 상황입니다. 이처럼 급변하는 국제 거래의 법적 분쟁과 무역 충돌에 대비함에 있어 가장 기본적이면서도 강력한 국가적 역량은 바로 국제적인 룰을 정확하게 이해하고 활용하는 능력입니다. 우리 기업과 국민들이 글로벌 무대의 한복판에서 자신의 장점을 극대화하고 활동 영역을 확장하기 위해서는 계약의 시작부터 분쟁의 종결에 이르는 전 과정이 예측 가능해야 하고 당사자의 권리 국제 또한 원활하게 작동할 수 있어야 합니다. 글로벌 시대에 부합하는 선진적인 국제법 지식과 법적 안전망이야말로 경제 발전의 추진력이자 국력의 척도와 직결되는 것입니다. 10여 년 전만 하더라도 국내 법조계와 무역 실무계는 국제상사 계약 원칙 등 국제거래법 전반에 대한 연구나 준비가 충분치 못한 실정이었습니다. 그러나 법률가들은 냉정한 현실 판단과 함께 국제적 흐름에 발맞추어 관련 연구에 박차를 가했고 국제상사소송 및 중재협약에 대한 이론적, 실무적 쟁점들을 부지런히 축적하기 시작했습니다. 나아가 로스쿨 과정의 국제거래법 과목을 편성하여 해당 분야의 미래 인재를 양성하는 등 글로벌 시대에 대비한 유의미한 성과들을 쌓아가고 있습니다. 이번 국제컨퍼런스는 국내외 유수의 학자 및 실무가 분들과 함께 국제상사소송과 관련된 전문적인 연구 성과를 집대성하며 그 향후 양상을 전문적으로 고찰하는 특별한 자리입니다. 국제상사계획의 현대화와 조화, 담보부 거래 및 도산, 외국 재판의 승인과 집행, 국제상사법원과 전자소송, 중재 및 조정의 승인과 집행이라는 다섯 가지 유기적인 주제를 통해 수준 높은 지적 탐구의 시간을 이끌어 주실 사회자, 발표자 및 토론자 여러분께 깊은 감사의 말씀을 전합니다. 아울러 바쁘신 중에도 귀하신 시간을 내시어 함께 해주신 국내 모든 귀빈 여러분께 다시 한번 감사 인사를 드립니다. 대한변호사협회는 2019년 전세계 법조인이 모이는 IBA 서울총회를 개최하는 한편 통상법 아카데미, 청년 법조인 해외 진출 아카데미 등 국제거래와 관련된 각종 실무 교육에 중점을 두고 적극적으로 추진하고 있습니다. 특히 우리 법조계와 무역 실무계에 강력한 지적 토대를, 토대를 제공할 이번 컨퍼런스를 후원하게 되어 매우 기쁩니다. 다시 한번 
국제 컨퍼런스 개최를 축하드리며 앞으로도 대한변호사협회는 글로벌 시대에 부응하는 대한민국의 사법 발전과 국제적 공조를 위한 학문적, 실무적 지원에 최선을 다하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you. We will end the opening ceremony. Before we start the fourth session, we would like to have a time for taking commemorative photos. We will take four group photos. I would like to ask you to take off your mask for a moment when taking photo shoots. For the fourth photo shoot, I would like to invite the distinguished guests, those who are seated at the head tables, and the president of Korea International Trade Law Association, the President of Korea Private International Law Association and the President of Association of Judges for International Commercial Law Studies. Please proceed to the stage with the guidance of our staff. Ladies and gentlemen, again, we will have the first photo shoot. This is for those who are seated at the head tables and also the presidents of the sponsor organizations. Those of you sitting at the head table, please join us up on the stage. Furthermore, Korea International Trade Law Association, Korea Private International Law Association, Association of Judges for International Commercial Law Studies, uh, the presidents of these three organizations, please join us up on the stage and you may take off your facial masks uh, during the photo shoot. Now for those who are standing at the stage now, please remain at the stage for the second photo shoot. 지금 기념 촬영하신 분들은 그대로 자리에 계시고 Again, please uh, remain on stage. For the second photo shoot, I would like to invite the moderators, speakers, and panelists for each session. Moderators, speakers, and panelists, please proceed to the stage. 각 세션의 사회자, 발표자, 토론자 분들은 Again, moderators, speakers, and panelists for each session, join us up on the stage for the next photo shoot. For the third photo shoot, I would like to invite the officials of our sponsor associations, moderators, speakers, and panelists who are also members of the sponsor association, please remain at the stage. 
The third photo shoot is for the officials of our sponsor organizations, moderators, speakers, and panelists who are also members of these sponsor organizations that are the Korean Bar Association, Korean International Trade Law Association, Korea Private International Law Association, Association of Judges for International Commercial Law Studies. Please join us upon the stage. Stage. Also, officials and representatives from the sponsor organizations, you're also welcome to join us up on the stage for the next photo op. Korean Bar Association, Korean International Trade Law Association, Korea Private International Law Association, and Association of Judges for International Commercial Law Studies. If you're from these organizations, please join us up on the stage. For the last photo shoot, I would like to now invite all other distinguished guests up to the stage. All the participants, including the members of JPRI, who are willing to take a commemorative photo, please proceed to the stage. JPRI members and those of you who wish to be in the picture, please join us on the stage. Again, JPRI members and those of you who wish to take uh, the photo up, please join us on the stage. Thank you. Session one of the conference will begin in a moment. So moderator and panelists of sessions one and two, please proceed to the stage and be seated in your designated seats. Ladies and gentlemen, we will begin session number one of the conference very shortly. I'd like to kindly ask the moderators and panelists uh, of this session to proceed to the stage and take your uh, designated seats. Now, I'm pleased to commence session one on modernizing and harmonizing international commercial contracts. 
The moderator of this fourth session is Mr. Taeyang Ro, an Honorable Justice of Supreme Court of Korea. He received an LLB from Hanyang University College of Law and LLM from Georgetown Law Center in 1996. He was appointed as a judge in 1990 and after serving as Chief Judge of Seoul Northern District Court in 2017, he was appointed as a Justice of the Supreme Court in 2020. He has previously served as the President of the Association of Judges for International Commercial Law Studies, the Vice President of Korea Private International Law Association, and the Presiding Judge of International Transactions Specialized Panel of Seoul High Court. Justice Rowe is one of the leading authorities in the area of international commercial law practices in Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, please greet him with a big round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Kim, uh, for such a kind um, introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, here and in front of computer screen online from abroad. So I may say uh, good afternoon and good, e good evening in addition. I'm Taeyang Ro. Uh, I'm so honored and privileged to be here and to be um, outstanding <coughs> and great, <coughs> I'm sorry, prestigious professors and scholars and commentators. For most uh, before um, the opening session as a moderate, I would like to appreciate JPRI for giving me the opportunity to participate in um, this international conference. I think it is very meaningful and a timely and precious event, especially with the Hague Conference on Private International Law, HCCH, and the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, UNIDRA and the United Nations Commissions on International Law, UNICITRA, all together. I uh, hear these <coughs> three organizations have recently adopted a new guide known as a tripartite guide. It's cr to clarify the relationships among each uniform law. I have considered in the context of international litigation the legal predictability is most important. I think uh, this event will be a great understanding and cornerstone for achieving this purpose. Um, today's conference main subject, as you all know, um, the international commercial litigation, recent development and future challenges. In the morning, uh, we have two sessions. The first session is about modernizing and harmonizing international commercial contract. The second session, secure transactions and insolvency. We have uh, three expert speakers in the first session, two speakers in the second session. I'm so happy with such distinguished speakers and two panels each session. They are all young and smart, brilliant judges. We can expect a discussion in the afternoon session. So um, let's begin with the first session. Let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Hiro Sono. Um, he's um, currently a professor of law at Hokkaido University. Uh, his main field um, is in contract law and international commercial law. Um, recently, he has been most uh, active in the field of international commercial law. Um, he also involved the three organizations of these interna this international organizations. Um, he is one of the uh, founding members of the CISG and Advisory Council, Council since 21. And from 2008 to 2018, he served as the um, Japanese delegate to 
to Unstral Working Group 4. Um, and also, he is also a um, correspondent to Unit Drua since 2015. So, um, his topic, uh, he is talking about this, his topic is CISG and Tripartite Guide. I think it's very timely and it will be a very informative story. So, um, let me turn it over to Professor Sono. Professor Sono, hello, are you there? Yes, I am here. Anyo okay. haseyo. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, okay. So, um, uh, let me turn it over to you. Okay, uh, please. Yes, thank you. Um, Good, good morning to everyone and good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are participating from different time zones. Um, thank you very much, uh, Justice Raw, for the very kind introduction. I would also like to thank um, the Digital Policy Research Institute for, and the other organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak about the CISG and the Tripartite Guide at the prestigious JPRI conference. Thank you. Um, I will share my slides. Okay. Um, as the first speaker of the session one on modernizing and harmonizing international commercial contracts, um, let me begin with the success story of the CISG. Could you hold on a second? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, in this year, uh, 2020, um, we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the CISG, the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods. CISG is a set of uniform contract law rules that are applicable to um, international sale of goods. It was adopted 40 years ago in 1980 and entered into force in 1988. The purpose of uh, or the goal of the CISG is declared in its preamble. The CISG aspires to contribute to the removal, this part, contribute to the removal of legal barriers in the international trade and promote the development of international trade. Here, the most significant legal barrier removed by the CISG is the existence of different national laws that may be applied to international sales. In other words, uniformity of law is um, uniformity of law applicable to international sale of goods is the immediate goal of the CISG. And CISG has been a major success. Currently, there are 94 contracting states, Republic of Korea being one, and my country, Japan, is another one from uh, this region. This map, this map um, shows the contracting states in green. You can see that the CISG is shared by a large number of states. Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, and Southeast Asia are areas that we would like to see more accessions of the CISG. But um, as you can see from this map, uh, this, the contracting states or the CISG covers most of uh, the international trade in, in the world. This map excuse me, not this map, this graph um, shows the number, well, this, this red line here shows the number of new contracting states each year, and in the blue line shows the total number of uh, contracting states in blue. The blue line starts from 1988, because that is the year when the CISG went into force. There was a somewhat steep increase in 1990, but after, and, and after that, you can see that the number of the contracting states is increasing steadily. 
the CISG has been a major success, not only in terms of the number of contracting states. It is actually used in court and arbitration to solve disputes. It is also successful in terms of the impact it had on international commercial contract law generally, and also on domestic contract law reforms as well. Um, for example, um, there has been, in, in the past few decades, there has been uh, uh, many reforms going on in, in various jurisdictions. Uh, for example, my country, Japan, um, adopted a new um, obligations law in 2017, which came into force this year. It has been influenced a lot by the CISG. I also understand that Korea is undertaking um, a project to um, reform the obligations law or the civil code. Um, and in that process, I understand that the CISG is, uh, is uh, being uh, uh, referred to. So this means that the model of contract law in the CISG is being shared around the globe. The success, excuse me, the success of the CISG has triggered an ambitious proposal from the government of Switzerland in 2012. The proposal was to consider, ex consider expanding the scope of the CISG beyond international sales to the broader context of general contract law so that the uniformity of law will be um, achieved in a broader scale. The proposal itself does not state this, but the most extreme implementation of this proposal would be to create a new convention on international commercial contracts. However, however at the same time, the CISG is already 40 years old, and the society and the economy has changed in this 40 years. For example, uh, there was no sign of the internet in 1980, when the CISG was adopted. We must remember that the CISG was prepared in the 1970s. For this reason, the Swiss proposal carefully suggested that an assessment of the operation of the CISG should also be carried out um, in light of the practical needs of international business parties today and tomorrow. Astral decided to further consider this uh, proposal in 2012, but um, it, it has been met with reluctance and hesitation. Reluctance and hesitation has been voiced, especially with regard to the, um, to the, to the proposal to expand the scope of the CISG. Concern about the feasibility was expressed because a work of such a magnitude will take up resources of the, of the Anstral for many years, and it is not at all certain uh, whether that work will result in an outcome that the member states of Anstral can agree upon. Another reason for the reluctance was that the CISG is no longer a stand-alone instrument. It's not a stand-alone instrument and that uh, together with other instruments emanating from the work of UNIDROA and the Hague Conference on International Private Law, uh, such as the UNIDROA Principles of International Commercial Contracts, I will sometimes refer to this as UPIC in my presentation, the UNIDROA Principles, and also the HCCH Principles on Choice of Law in International Commercial Contracts of 2015. Uh, there is already, with these um, instruments, there is already a set of international commercial law, even without expanding the scope of the CISG. Astral also has conventions supplementing the CISG. One is the Convention on the Limitation Period, Prescription Periods, in the International, international Sale of Goods. The other is the UN Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications in International Contracts. So they, they operate, all of these instruments operate in tandem and create a body of uh, international commercial contract law. It was in light of, uh, it was in this light um, that Anstral, together with UNIDRAW and the Hague Conference, decided to prepare the tripartite guide. The full title of the tripartite guide is the legal guide to uniform legal instruments in the area of international commercial contracts with a focus on sales. The guide was approved by the three organizations this year, 
uh, first by the Hague Conference and then uh, by Indra and lastly by uh, Anstro. Uh, this guide is available, the, the latest version of the guide is available on Anstro's website, but it is still in the form of uh, commission session document and it's not user friendly. Um, I understand that the, the secretariat is preparing a more user friendly version of um, the guide uh, for publication. The purpose of the tripartite guide is stated in paragraph 7 and 11 of the guide. Um, I will quote from paragraph 11. It states that um, here, that the guide is an effort to clarify the relationship among those uniform international legal texts and is a document prepared jointly by the three secretariats to promote uniformity, certainty, and clarity in this area of law. One important point that the tripartite guide makes is that the Unidrop principles, the UPIC, is an important instrument that can assist in interpreting and supplementing the CISG. The UPIC presents principles of international commercial contracts and is broader in scope than the CISG. It covers not only international sales, but also international commercial contract law generally. It also deals with issues that the CISG does not cover. Now, for example, the CISG do does not cover the question of validity, such as mistake, fraud, public policy. It doesn't deal with agency, third party rights, um, set off, assignment of receivables, plurality of obligors and obligees, etc. The UPIC deals with these issues, these matters as well. However, uh, the UPIC is not a binding instrument, instrument like the CISD. It is a soft law instrument, and one may wonder how a soft law instrument, a non-binding soft law instrument, such as the UNIRA principles, can help to supplement the CISD. In this regard, the tripartite guides uh, explains that there are two mechanisms, two ways by which the UPIC can supplement the CISG. Uh, this slide shows only the first um, uh, mechanism. First um, is the application of the UPIC by the choice of parties. To make this possible, the tripartite guide points to, the, to one significant development in the area of international private law that is the acceptance of rules of law as an applicable law. Rules of law is not to be confused with the, the, the principle of rule of law, uh, which means that the government and the judiciary must be based on law. It's not that rule, rule of law. Rules of law um, are non-state laws and those that are generally accepted, ah, here is a definition, those that are generally accepted on an international, supranational, or regional level as a neutral and balanced set of rule, rules. Um, and this includes the Unidoro principles, UPIC. In the arbitration setting, uh, the Austral model law on international commercial arbitration um, already accepted uh, this principle, this idea of allowing choice of rules of law in 1985. In the judicial setting, uh, the Hague principles on the choice of law in, in international commercial contract, the HCCH principles of, of 2015 also accepts um, this uh, principle. This trend to accept non-binding soft law instruments such as the, the Union of Principles is one of the keys that allows the development of international commercial law, commercial contract law. The second way, uh, which is not on the slide, is that the second way how the UPIC can supplement the CISG is that um, it can be used to supplement the CISG as uh, through Article 7, Paragraph 2 of the CISG, um, which is to say that the, the Union of Principles may embody uh, the general principles underlying the CISG. I will quote from the tri uh, tripartite guide. The UPIC do not embody per se the general principles on which the CISG is based. 
However, it may well be argued that at least some of the rules contained in the UPIC are restatements of general principles of international commercial contract law on which the CISG is based. So there are these mechanisms to supplement the CISG by the UPIC, by the, by the unidirectional principles, and to, and to make international commercial law more complete. So this is a success story. However, uh, there are also challenges that must, that must be met. Um, first, uh, since the interpretation of the CISG is decentralized, by which I mean that um, it is not, there is no supranational Supreme Court that um, interprets and applies the CISG. It is done by each national court or arbitral tribunal. And so there must be a mechanism or method um, to achieve uniformity in interpretation. And otherwise, the purpose of the CISG will not be achieved because different courts, different, different jurisdictions will, will interpret it differently. Um, one mechanism um, that is available is the CLOUT. Uh, this is an acronym for the case law on Unstral texts. This is a database that um, is prepared by the Unstral Secretariat and it shows um, cases that apply, um, um, it, 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 uh, it shows judicial court decisions and arbitral awards um, that apply astral texts such as the CISG. Um, Korea um, has 27 cases on the database now that are uh, about cases applying the CISG. Japan, uh, to my dismay, uh, there is none on the database at the moment. However, there has been three cases in 2019 and 2020 this year, so um, it, 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 will, um, it should come up shortly. Um, so uh, by, by using this uh, database, um, it makes it possible to, for each um, national court to see what other um, jurisdictions are doing with the CISG and through cooperation between, um, through these loose cooperations between national courts, uh, uniformity is expected to be, uniformity in interpretation is expected to be achieved. Now, um, as for supplementing the CISG, by the UPIC, um, it is not always easy. Um, if there are here external gaps, which are gaps uh, in matters not governed by the CISG, such as validity or agency, uh, third party rights, um, that, would, that would not be problematic as, as far as UPIC is applicable by choice um, of the parties or the tribunal. However, filling in internal gaps, uh, which are gaps um, in matters governed by the CISG, can be problematic because first it must be determined that there is actually an internal gap. Um, I would like to take the example of the question of interest rate. Um, the CISG provides in Article 78 that um, interest should be paid for late payment. However, the CIC does not provide the interest rate to be used. Um, if this is an internal gap, there is a possibility of filling the gap by reference to Article 7.4.9 of the Unira Principles. Uh, and in that case, the interest rate will be um, the rate, uh, the, the interest rate will be the average bank short-term lending rate to prime borrowers prevailing for the currency of the payment at the place for payment. Um, however, it is possible that there is no gap at all. The CISG Advisory Council opinion number 14 considers that there is no gap. Um, and it states that um, in the absence of agreement of the parties, the applicable rate of interest is the rate which the court at the creditors place of business would grant in a similar would be granted in a similar contract of sale not governed by the CISG. The rationale is that um, the payment of interest is one form of damages and since damages are to compensate the loss of the creditor, the interest the creditor should receive should be the amount it will need to pay to borrow that amount from a bank and therefore the rate should be the rate at the creditor's place of uh, business. That's the rationale behind the CIC Advisory Council's opinion 
And as you can see, there can be different um, interpretations and it is a challenge um, to maintain a uniform interpretation. That, that is something that we all have to uh, meet through continued effort. I will, sc I will skip this slide. Um, another challenge that we must meet is that uh, we need more accessions to the CISG, especially in, the re in this region. By in this region, I mean the East Asian um, region. Um, as uh, I have mentioned, there's only China, Singapore, Republic of Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Laos, and North Korea that are um, contracting states uh, to the CISG in this region. But there is also another um, convention, the Limitation Convention, uh, which works in tandem with the CISG. Um, this, th this convention uh, provides a uniform rule for limitation periods, prescription periods, uh, which is four years. In 1974, when this uh, convention was prepared, many jurisdictions had a very long uh, limitation period. Some jurisdictions had a limitation period of 30 years, and it was considered that that is too long for international sales, and that was why uh, this convention was prepared, and it, it, it uh, provided for a short uh, four years um, limitation period. However, um, things has changed since then. Many jurisdictions have shortened the limitation period in their national national legislations. For example, Japan now, it used to be 10 years in Japan, now it's five years, it has become shorter. So, uh, so under that uh, situation, there is another justification for this limitation convention, because um, in the past, if the limitation period is for 30 years, very few claims will be subject to limitation periods. I mean, you don't really have to wait for 30 years to enforce the, the claim. But if the limitation period is short, four years, five years, maybe three years, that will mean that many claims will be subject to limitation periods. And if we apply different national laws on the limitation period, that will lead to uncertainty in the international trade. So the ju justification for the limitation convention today is that uh, it, I, I, there is another justification for the limitation convention. However, as this map shows, there are only 30 contracting states the limitation period, at, limitation convention at the moment, and there are none from the Asian uh, region. And this is an area where I would like to see more um, accessions, ratifications of this uh, convention. And these are the challenges that we must all endeavor to meet in order to continue the success story of um, international commercial contract law. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. And thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sono. Um, I hope you see again in the discussion session in this afternoon. Thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. And let's move on. Next speak, second speak. Um, let me introduce um, the second speaker, Professor Anna Benetiano. Um, she is um, deputy, deputy secretary general of UNIDROA. Um, she is. Um, a professor of comparative law at the University of Teramo, Italy, where she was um, formerly the director of the Department for Private Law. Um, and she is at, uh, at UNIDROA. She involved in drafting of UNIDROA for I further legal guide on contracting farming in the implementation of the Cape Town Convention protocols uh, in the negotiation of the mining, agriculture, and construction protocol. She represented UNIDRA in the drafting of the tripartite guide on the uniform contract law and was co-chair of the steering committee of the ELI UNIDRA European Rules of Civil Pro Procedure Project. And please refer to in details for the materials. Okay, um, she sent us the um, pre-recorded message um, because she was um, in the night, in the uh, night. So, um, and we can see, her, we can hear um, in, in this afternoon for discussion session. So, um, Professor Veneziano, is he ready? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
I would like first of all to express my deep appreciation and gratefulness uh, to the Judicial Policy Research Institute uh, represented here by its president and uh, to the sister organizations, uh, the Hague Conference uh, on Private International Law and uh, uh, the uh, United Nations Commission on, on International Trade Law uh, for uh, co-organizing uh, this, uh, this ev uh, event. Um, I am honored uh, and it's a, a great pleasure to represent here UNIDRA together with my Secretary General and to share uh, this uh, first panel with such excellent colleagues. Uh, I have to apologize to the distinguished chair uh, and co-panelists uh, as well as uh, the, to you all for not appearing live. Uh, due to the time zone difference, but I will uh, participate in the following discussion panel, so I will be able to see you even if not uh, in person. So as, as you see, the topic of this presentation is the UNIDRA principles of international commercial contracts uh, and uh, uh, therefore I will not touch upon uh, one of the initiatives that uh, the three secretariats uh, undertook together at the initiative of ANCITRAL and uh, uh, which was concluded this year with the approval by all three secretariats, that is the tripartite uh, guide, uh, which I think was already uh, presented by uh, my esteemed colleague uh, Hiro Sono. So, but I was I wanted just to say how delighted we were to participate in that uh, important uh, endeavour. Um, so. These are the UNIDRA principles 2016. Uh, I uh, will uh, give a shorter presentation than the slides and materials that I have uh, uh, put, uh, uh, that were put at your disposal. And for any additional um, information, I will uh, uh, refer back to those materials. Uh, but you can also visit our website to have uh, uh, more uh, information. Now, since they first appeared in uh, 94 and throughout their following editions, culminating in the latest one in 2016, which you see here, the UNIDRA principles have become indeed a flagship instrument of our institute, not only gaining significant worldwide recognition in academic discourse, which is something that we can see, uh, but also influencing national and supranational legislators and being used in practice in a variety of ways, including references in a number of uh, uh, arbitral awards and court decisions uh, around the globe. And I would like to refer to a most recent uh, recognition, which is the endorsement of the uh, UIA, representing two million lawyers from uh, uh, over 100 countries, and the work that we're doing together with the International Bar Association. So the plan here is to uh, um, uh, look at the UNIDRA principles, uh, what they are, how they can be and have been used in practice with some examples. And this is exactly how I would like to start with a practical example, uh, which is taken from uh, a real case uh, referring to the UNIDRA principles. Um, there was a series of contracts between uh, uh, an English company and uh, a government agency of a Middle Eastern country for the supply of equip equipment. There was a clause in that contract uh, saying that uh, the settlement of future disputes uh, was to be done according to laws and rules of natural justice. Now, why would uh, uh, such a, a general clause be inserted in, uh, uh, in a contract? Uh, um, 
this uh, might happen because neither party is strong enough to impose its own domestic law. So for most uh, contracts, we would have one domestic law chosen by the party, which it, when the parties uh, make this choice, which would be the, uh, the law applicable to the contract. Uh, or it could be that parties cannot agree on the choice of the domestic law of a third country, which might be seen as uh, neutral or more suitable. Uh, so in this case, neither of the situation was probably the one that happened. And there is a third issue, which is also very important. Domestic law is often perceived as not being well suited to settle disputes regarding international contracts. And so the solution in the end was that the arbitral tribunal held that parties intended to exclude the application of any domestic, specific domestic law, and they wanted their contract governed by general principles of commercial law. But uh, in order to have an objective standard and in order to find uh, a good set of rules, uh, the arbitral tribunal uh, referred to the UNIDRA principles. So this is one of the possible situations where a uh, codification of the kind of the UNIDRA principles can be extremely helpful uh, in this case in uh, settling a, a dispute, in, first of all in the, in the drafting of the contract, but in this case in settling a dispute regarding uh, the contract. So uh, now I will take a step back and uh, I will uh, go uh, to the UNIDRA principles and have a look at uh, what they are, uh, their origin and development, uh, and then to see how they can and have been applied in practice with some uh, uh, examples. Now, uh, here on this uh, slide, I would like to highlight in particular three points. First of all, uh, the fact that the UNIDRA principles have been uh, uh, developed by a um, uh, uh, group uh, uh, of experts, uh, uh, eminent experts sitting in their personal capacity and there was also participation, for example, um, of an observer for the government of, of Korea throughout the first editions of the UNIDRA principles. Secondly, I would like to underline the long history of the work in this area, which encompasses, of course, uh, the work done at UNIDRA uh, on international commercial sales contracts, uh, then uh, the excellent uh, result of the CSG um, at uh, uh, Ancitral, and, and then uh, later on the development of the UNIDRA principles uh, with, uh, with a special working group uh, uh, under the chairmanship of uh, uh, Professor Bonnell. Uh, and the third point that I would like to underline here is the fact that the UNIDRA principles are translated in all major world languages, uh, this including Korean. We have a Korean translation of the 2016 uh, uh, UNIDRA principles available on the UNIDRA webpage, and we would like to express our gratitude to Professor Won Suk Oh and uh, the professors collaborating with him uh, for uh, undertaking uh, this, uh, uh, this translation. Now, uh, what, uh, why principles of international commercial contracts? Uh, this is something I will touch upon uh, rather quickly. Uh, um, we can uh, uh, see that principles uh, have certain advantages, but they can also have certain disadvantages as opposed to uh, a, a treaty like, for example, CSG. So they could be seen as le less effective because they are not binding rules. They are applied because of their persuasive value. They are sort of a private uh, codification um, authenticated by an international organization in this case. Uh, uh, and their application is completely left uh, to the decision of parties or adjudicators. But this may render actually principles uh, more effective. Why? 
First of all, it is easier to reach uh, an agreement on best practices because of the fact that uh, you don't need to go through the uh, discussions of a diplomatic conference or decisions of governments. They are usually well suited to party uh, autonomy and they are more easily adapted to changing conditions in international trade. And the uh, most important element that I would like to underline here is uh, that those principles are a tool, something that can be used and have been used when they are perceived to be useful by parties or by adjudicators. Um, so the UNIDRA principles 2016 consist of a preamble and tw uh, two uh, uh, 211 articles accompanied by comments and illustrations covering the most important areas of contract law and the law of obligations. Here there is a list of all the areas that are already covered by the UNIDRA principles. Uh, the latest edition has special rules and comments regarding long-term contracts and they contain solutions generally accepted by various legal systems and or most suited to the special needs of international trade. Now I will come back uh, to, to this point, the point of uh, the rules being uh, uh, generally accepted uh, or uh, most suited to the special needs of international trade in my last slide if we have, uh, if we have time. Now I would like to come to the poss possible applications of the UNIDRA principles and we have to refer to the preamble of the principles for that. Uh, they can be used for a number of purposes. I have divided the, the, um, those possibilities into two main blocks. They are a tool for party autonomy. They can be guidelines, for example, for drafting international contracts. They can be expressly cho cho uh, chosen by the parties as the law governing their contract or, as we will see, as uh, the uh, content of their contract. And they can also be used, for example, as guidelines to reach settlement agreements. But they have been used and can be used as tools for adjudicators, especially by arbitral tribunals uh, applying the principles as the law governing their contract, either in the situation which was the example that I made at the beginning, when contracts contain a general reference to general principles of international commercial contracts and the like, in uh, uh, certain situations also when parties did not choose any applicable law and decided, uh, however, clearly in the language of the contract uh, and uh, in other clauses that they did not want uh, one specific uh, uh, domestic law to be applicable. Uh, but they have also appla been applied by domestic courts and arbitral tribunals uh, to interpret international uniform law and to interpret uh, uh, domestic uh, law. Uh, they have been used as model for in national international legislator and uh, of course they can be used in the, uh, other, uh, other ways. Um, and here you can see, you can find uh, the collection of cases on uh, the UNIDRA principles. This is a, a, a database freely available online, uh, which contains uh, a number of cases including arbitral awards and also uh, court decisions on the UNIDRA principles uh, for you to, uh, to access and to consider. Um, now, I would like in this uh, uh, latest part of the presentation to uh, look at some examples on when the UNIDRA principles have been uh, uh, practically uh, applied uh, by um, uh, judges or chosen by parties. And uh, the first example is uh, uh, a use not expressly contemplated in the preamble of the principles. The UNIDRA principles uh, can be particularly useful to parties when negotiating and drafting international contracts. Uh, and in this case, uh, when negotiating, for example, a settlement agreement, uh, 
One of the reasons is because they are available in all major languages of the world. Another is that they can serve as a checklist of issues parties may wish to address in their contract, but especially they might, may serve as model clauses parties may wish to incorporate their contract with or without adaptation. But this is not the only possibility to use the unidual principles. Parties may expressly choose them when drafting their contract. And indeed, uh, the uh, UNIDRA has developed a series of model clauses in 2013 that you can find on our website, which include a variety of options to do so. And so I would like to look at this uh, option, the option of choosing the UNIDRA principles when uh, drafting a contract as the law applicable to the contract, uh, looking at a, a practical case. Uh, now, uh, in, uh, uh, of, uh, this is a case where the choice of the UNIDRA principles was not made in the initial contract, but happened when a dispute arose uh, within uh, an arbitral um, uh, proceedings. Uh, there was a contract between a Turkish company and a company incorporated in the West Indies concerning high, highly so, uh, sophisticated equipment. Uh, this contract uh, uh, contained uh, uh, two conflicting choice of law clauses, uh, one in favor of English law, the other in favor of Swiss law. The arbitral tribunal in this situation of stall suggested the application uh, of the unidual principles as a choice for the parties, and the parties did so, applying a number of uh, articles of the unidual principles. So a way to um, solve a, 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 a problem in finding a suitable applicable law. But this is uh, uh, not the only application of the uh, UNDO principles here. I would like to very quickly say that uh, commentators usually distinguish between arbitral tribunals and national courts, and choosing the principles as the law applicable to the contract is much easier in the first case, which because it's uh, encompassed uh, in the broader term rules of law as opposed to law. Uh, the difference being that courts would mostly consider this choice as uh, um, uh, an inclusion of the principles in the content of the contract instead of being a veritable choice of law uh, with application of any mandatory provisions of the applicable domestic law. But for most contract law issues, however, I would like to say that this might not be particularly uh, relevant in, uh, in practice. Uh, still, it is a distinction that, uh, that is made and you can find the relevant uh, provisions here. And we can also find here the Hague uh, principles on the choice of law in international commercial contracts which where, where there is a strong suggestion to open up to party autonomy. Also at national level, uh, those principles will be presented by, by my colleague, uh, Joao Ribeiro Bidawi, in, in a short while, so I'm not going into, into them now. But allow me to uh, conclude this presentation by looking at one very uh, recent case uh, where uh, an appellate court in this case in France, decided on the uh, choice by uh, an uh, arbitrator to um, apply the UNIDRA principles as the rules of law of the contract when parties had not uh, expressly referred to the UNIDRA principles. And uh, this is an interesting case because uh, um, the, um, the Court of Appeal, the Appellate Court, found that the parties had never agreed to apply a specific domestic law to their dispute and that the arbitrators, by applying the UNIDRA principles, did not decide ex equo and bono, but according to rules of law. And therefore, the, uh, they uh, confirmed the arbitrator's de decisions, not only on the question of the applicable law, but also uh, on, on the merits. Um, there are many other situations where the UNIDRA principles have been found uh, useful, for example, as uh, a tool 
to interpret and supplement domestic law. I don't think I have sufficient time to go into this. I have been given 20 minutes and they're almost up. Uh, so I will be happy to uh, go back to this uh, uh, later on in a discussion. But suffice it to say that the reason why the UNIVA principles uh, are so useful uh, is because they can be used in a variety of ways and they can, for example, also be referred to uh, when there is the application of a specific domestic law by courts, if that uh, domestic law is developing, is uh, evolving, and uh, the refer, uh, referring to the UNIVA principles might help the uh, application of uh, uh, the um, uh, one uh, solution that the judges, that the courts think that should prevail over another solution, especially if that solution is more suitable to international commercial contracts. The example I left for you, and it's not the only one, there are also more, more recent ones, is an example of the Federal Court of Australia regarding the um, uh, uh, rules uh, 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 the application of, of good faith in the negotiation of the contracts, uh, but there are, of course, also uh, other uh, examples. So, uh, let me conclude by referring to uh, one particular issue where the UNIDRA principles can be seen as encompassing what is not considered just a common core already existing, for example, in uniform law, uh, and we have many of those common core rules uh, in the CSG that uh, were influenced very strongly the UNIDRA principles, but uh, also other provisions uh, which are purposely innovative. Among those, for example, the rules on hardship, which apply in the case of exceptional supervising events, disrupting contractual equilibrium, and which were already a model for national legislators and contractual model clauses, uh, lately the ICC model clauses, are particularly important and we think useful also in the present context of the outbreak of COVID-19 and the resulting public health and economic crisis, because they offer an efficient tool to help preserve valuable contract for the parties, allowing for an adequate renegotiation and a proportionate allocation of losses. And we have preferred guidance uh, on this. Uh, I'm just referring to it uh, in this uh, slide that you see, uh, hoping that you might be uh, interested in, in reading this note that was developed uh, by our uh, secretariat. So this is the conclusion. Uh, of, uh, of my presentation. Uh, so I would like to thank you again for your attention. Uh, for more information, please visit our website, but I will be happy to discuss with you then live uh, in a, a later panel. And thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I give back the floor to our distinguished chair. Thank you, Professor uh, Veneziano. Um, it's a wonderful and insightful and informative uh, story. She explained, she talked about the UNIDRA principles of international commercial contract, as known as UP, um, as a tool for successful drafting and adjudication in transnational contract. Thank you again. And we also see her um, in this afternoon at real time, I hope. And then we move on the last speaker in the first session. Uh, let me introduce the last speaker, um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Joao Ribeiro Bidawi. Uh, Dr. Ribeiro Bidawi has primary research um, responsibility at the Permanent Bureau of HCCH of um, the 20. Five um, choice of court and 2019 judgment conventions. The principles on choice of law and the just uh, jurisdiction project. And Dr. Uh, Ribeiro Bidawi was um, head of the UNSTRA Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific and served as um, head of international affairs of the Ministry of Justice of Portugal. Um, he is currently. Um, conducting research at the University of Cambridge, um, United Kingdom, on um, legitimacy issues related to treaty law making. 
And so um, uh, we uh, we uh, we are uh, talk, uh, we are expecting pro, uh, Doctor Joao Ribeiro Pitaui. Is is he ready? Oh. Okay, please. Fellow colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great pleasure and an honor to address this prestigious event, an event that brings together the three sister organizations in the field of international private law. And what an opportunity it is to discuss such pressing issues as in the program with the Korean judiciary. I must say that only meaningful experiences come to my mind when I recall the several opportunities that I had to work with Korean judges, not only now and here at the HECH and in particular with Justices uh, Dong Won Kang, Yoon Jung Choi and Su Jin Cho, but also during the five years that I lived in Korea when working with Ancitra. However, that was not enough time for me to deliver this presentation in Korean, and I'm hoping for your forgiveness on, on that regard. I am currently the HECH first secretary in charge of overseeing the work related to the transnational litigation and legal cooperation instruments, such as the Service and Evidence Conventions, the Choice of Court Convention, and the Judgments Convention, of which I had also charge of the final stages of its negotiation and adoption. Today, I'm expected to talk about another important HECH instrument, the principles on choice of law in international commercial contracts, known to most as the Hague principles, but that I will stubbornly refer to as the HECH principles. After outlining the contents and structure of the principles, I will focus my address on the role they play in modernizing and harmonizing international commercial contracts, a role that has been recognized by the formal endorsement of the principles by both ANSITRAL and by the International Chamber of Commerce. Before jumping into the, the crux of the matter, allow me to provide a brief, very brief background surrounding the adoption of the principles. They were developed at the heart of the Hague Conference on Private International Law by the Working Group on the Choice of Law in international contracts. This working group acted upon the mandate in 2009 by the HECH governing body, the Council on General Affairs and Policy. The 2011 draft principles prepared by the working group were approved by a special commission in November 2012. And the final version of the principles, along with the commentary, were formally approved on 19 March 2015 as the first soft law instrument of this organization in over 125 years. This means that this year we celebrate the fifth anniversary of their adoption. But what are its contents and its structure? The principles are a set of 12 articles with a preamble and an article by article commentary. They aim at reinforcing and promoting the principle of party autonomy in international commercial contracts. This means that the parties are entitled to select the law or rules of law governing their legal relationship and that their choices are respected. Put simply, this non-binding soft law instrument contains general rules affirming the freedom of the parties to choose the law applicable to their contract and ensuring that the law chosen by them has the widest scope of application subject to limited exceptions. The principles provide guidance only for situations in which the parties have made an express or tacit choice of law by agreement. And they are particularly uh, helpful to determine such tacit choice of law. At their heart, the principles recognize that giving effect to party autonomy at the global level is key to promoting cross-border commercial transactions as it enhances certainty and predictability in respect of the party's contractual arrangements. In essence, the principles contain three broad categories of rules. A first group reflects the view of the HECH 
as to what constitutes a best practice. This set of rules provides helpful clarifications and further refinement of the party autonomy regime that most countries have already adopted. An example of this can be found in Article 7, which establishes that the choice of law agreement is severable from the underlying contract, in the sense that the valid choice of law cannot be contested solely on the ground that the contract to which it applies is not valid. A second group uh, of rules comprises novel provisions, notably one of the most prominent uh, features of the principles is the provision in Article 3 that expressly allows the parties to choose rules of law to govern their contracts, which means that parties are allowed to choose transnational or non-state law. Although this is relatively a settled question in arbitration proceedings, the vast majority of domestic private international law systems do not authorize an adjudicator to apply non-state law. The third group of provisions reflect an approach that enjoys international consensus, such as the recognition in Article 11 that party autonomy may be constrained by overriding mandatory rules and public policy. Now, I will provide a brief overview of the contents of the principles for the sake of completeness. The principles apply to choice of law agreements in international commercial contracts, and the contract is deemed commercial when each party is acting in the exercise of its trade or profession. Article 1 expressly excludes consumer or employment contracts from the scope of the principles due to the well-established principle of protecting weaker parties in such contracts. Under Article 1, Paragraph 2 of the principles, a commercial contract will be deemed international whenever there is at least one objective foreign element. The matters that fall outside of the scope are listed in Article 1, Paragraph 3 and include arbitration and choice of court agreements and insolvency matters. The principles. The principles stress that the parties, in use of their freedom of choice, are at liberty to select the law that will govern their contract, to determine whether the chosen law will govern the contract in its entirety or only in part, to determine whether different laws should govern different parts of the contract, to choose a law not connected to the parties or their transaction, thus enabling parties to choose a neutral law or a developed law in a specific sector or industry, to designate the applicable law, including its conflict of laws regime, and notably parties may indirectly choose the applicable substantive law by expressly choosing rules of private international law, to choose a law at any point in time or subsequently modify it without the need to comply with any formality unless otherwise agreed by the parties, to expressly or tacitly make the choice of law and subsequently modify such choice, and finally, they are at liberty, rules of law as the governing law, unless otherwise provided by the Lex Fori. However, such rules of law must be qualified as generally accepted at an international, supranational or regional level as a neutral and balanced set of rules. They would include international treaties and uniform law conventions, as well as non-binding instruments formulated by established international bodies. In practice, this means that the parties may choose non-state laws, such as the CISG, when its application is not automatically triggered, or the UNIDRA principles. But they may not select abstract contractual principles, such as Pacta Sunt Servanda or other bodies of law lacking legitimacy or comprehensiveness such as the Lex Mercatoria in the narrow sense. The principles also um, establish criteria to determine the existence of the choice of law agreement, and they do so in two ways. First, 
by establishing that the choice of law agreement is severable from the underlying contract. The logical consequence is that the formal or material invalidity of the main contract does not automatically lead to the invalidity of the choice of law agreement. Therefore, the choice of law agreement may be declared invalid only on grounds specifically affecting it. Secondly, they can do so by providing useful guidance in a battle of forms case. When the standard forms used by one party differ from the standard forms used by the other, confusion may arise as to the law chosen by the parties. And if that was the case, Article 6 may prove very, very useful. The principles also provides a non-exhaustive list of aspects that may be governed by the chosen law, namely the validity or interpretation of the contract or the period of limitation, while also providing a separate rule concerning assignment of claims in Article 10. Party autonomy, as recognized by the principles, is not absolute. As in all jurisdictions that, that recognize party autonomy, the principles provide also limitations. Article 11, under Article 11, a court or arbitral tribunal may decline to give effect to the law chosen by the parties in the exceptional circumstances where such law, of course, contravenes overriding mandatory rules or public policy of the forum or of the third state. Now that we have been introduced to the general structure and key features of the principles, let me make the case for the role that the principles may play in modernizing and harmonizing international commercial contracts and related legal regimes. There are two main dimensions in which the principles may assist in the modernization and harmonization of international commercial law. When used as a model law, and when used by courts, judges, tribunals, arbitrators as an hermeneutic device. The principles can indeed play a pivotal role in the harmonization of uh, commercial contracts to the extent that one of its intended uses is that of a model law. It is therefore meant to serve as a blueprint in those countries wishing to modernize their legal regime governing choice of law in commercial contracts by adopting the novel provisions foreseen in the principles or wishing to further refine and clarify their existing regimes. In a similar fashion to other well-established model laws, the principles constitute an invaluable tool for policymakers and legislators around the globe seeking to adjust their choice of law regimes in response to the demands and challenges posed by the enduring, even if waning, globalization. Due to their flexible and simple yet comprehensive nature, the principles may be either incorporated in whole or in part to existing legal instruments, or they may be used as an inspiration to conduct legal reforms at the domestic, regional, and international levels. As such, they help to set and perpetuate a canon in the application and construction of the concept of party autonomy across jurisdictions. As a case in point, Paraguay stands out as the first country to have enacted a law inspired by the HECH principles. And as we speak, the Mozambican government is considering a new legal regime for commercial contracts which incorporates the principles entirely. If successfully concluded, such reform will be the result of close coordination and cooperation between the HECH and the World Bank. The second uh, dimension in which the principles may assist in the modernization and the uh, harmonization of international commercial law is when they provide guidance to courts and judges, to arbitral tribunals and arbitrators on how to approach issues concerning the choice of law in international contracts. The, the principal's role in helping to interpret and supplement rules concerning the implementation of party autonomy will eventually result, we hope, in a substantial degree of harmonization of contractual conflicts rules in respect of the choice of law. Also, 
by unifying the relevant conflict rules for court proceedings and arbitral proceedings, the HECH principles envisage legal certainty and international harmony of decisions independently of the method and venue of dispute resolution. It is against this backdrop that the Permanent Bureau of the HECH has this year liaised with over 70 arbitral institutions from around the globe to inquire about the compatibility of their arbitration rules with the tenants enshrined in the principles. To date, we have received responses from institutions based in four different continents. The results have been compiled in a status table available in our website. They show those arbitral institutions that either have incorporated the principles into, into their own institutional rules or are advertising or facilitating their use in other ways. This uh, status table, this list, is geared towards providing information about arbitral institutions, rules and proceedings that respect and interpret a contractually chosen law in accordance with the principles for the benefit of private parties wishing to resort to arbitral proceedings. The Permanent Bureau is therefore committed to updating this list, this status table, on an annual basis in order to keep interested parties and stakeholders abreast of current trends and developments. In conclusion, the Permanent Bureau, in line with its mandate, will continue to engage with relevant stakeholders and potential users to raise awareness of the principles and to promote their wider use. To this aim, the Permanent Bureau has prepared a roadmap for the promotion of the HECH principles, outlining the best course of action to achieve this goal. On that note, allow us please to invite the Korean judiciary to have a closer look at the principles and to consider them whenever a choice of law issue may arise in the many contractual disputes that are inherent to a vibrant economy which promotes the rule of law. We do hope also that in the many meaningful educational programs, including in assisting foreign judiciaries in their capacity building, JPRI would consider to further include the study of the principles in its programs. I will now conclude, if I may, with one of my favorite quotes from Tobias Asser, who won the Nobel Peace Prize and the founding ju jurist of the Hague Conference. And I quote, truly fortunate is the nation which sets itself the goal of finding the means to improve on broad scale all in its current legislation that still hampers trade and especially international trade and does so with the intent, whilst maintaining the guarantee that justice shall be properly administered, of seeing accepted the principle of mutual recognition of judgments, the equality before the law of subjects and foreigners in matters of trade, and so many, so many other wishes generally expressed, acknowledged as legitimate, and endorsed my, by multitudes, end of quote. I thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Ribeiro Bidawi. Um, he focused on the international, uh, the modernization and harmonization of international commercial law um, as, um, for the venue, jurisdiction, and choice of law, and rules of law. Legal certainty is very important. I can, um, so um, thank you again, Mr. Ribeiro, for um, your presentation. And so with that, um, the first session is done. And thank you for your attention. It was an informative and insightful presentation on the interpretation of the successful instruments relating to the international commercial contracts. Please join me in giving all participants of the session one a warm round of applause. Now we will begin session two without a break. We will address secure transaction and insolvency in session two. 
The moderator of the session is Honorable Justice Tia Rowe. Justice Rowe, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you. Um, without break, we have to begin the second session. Thank you for your patience. The second session is the title of Secure Transactions and Insolvency. Um, we have two expert speakers. Um, uh, so, um, first speaker, uh, let me introduce the first speaker, um, the Egan Professor Ignacio Tirado. Um, he's currently Secretary General of UNIDROA. Professor Ignacio, uh, Ignacio Tirado was a um, appointed Secretary General by the Governing Council at 97th session and officially took office on 27 August 2018. Professor Tinano has been a senior legal consultant at World Bank's legal vice presidency and financial sector practice for more than nine years. Um, having also consulted for the IMF on insolvency-related matters as well as for the Asian Development Bank on commercial legal reform. Professor Tirado is a founding member of the European Banking Institute, um, an international fellow of the American College of Bankrupts, and has been directed academic co-chair of the International Insolvency Institute. So, um, Professor Ignacio Tirado, um, is he ready? Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, from Rome. It is now uh, late in the evening here. Uh, by the time this is shown, it will be early morning in Seoul. So, uh, um, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, greet you all. I should say that uh, it is also um, my um, sadness and detriment that uh, I have to greet you via video and uh, not in person as I would have liked to do. Um, being in uh, Korea would, be, would have been indeed our preference. Uh, but these days there's very little we can do uh, to overcome the, the ter difficult situation that we are all uh, living through. So um, I am hopeful, however, that I will be able to, to come to Korea soon and, and greet you all in person. Um, I think uh, it is in order also uh, to show uh, gratitude to the uh, Judicial Policy Research Institute um, for inviting uh, UNIDRA and myself and, and my uh, deputy, Anna Veneziano, uh, to participate in, in this international conference, uh, which is surrounded by extraordinary local and regional experts and uh, with the co-participation of our sister organizations, um, the Hague Conference on Private International Law and uh, UNCITRAL, um, whose um, participants I would also like to, uh, to greet, although uh, in this case I get the chance to do that more often. Um, so I'm going to uh, introduce to you uh, the Cape Town system with some uh, data and, and, and theoretical explanations. In order to do that, I'm going to share with you um, a um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, I've been trying to uh, um, uh, program this in a way in which you see less of my face and more of this slide, but uh, this is the best I've, I've been able to manage. Um, right, so... Um, um, what we are going to do um, now is, is go over uh, the um, uh, Cape Town Convention system. Uh, as you will see, it covers different types of equipment and um, different types of um, financing transactions. Uh, um, but um, And therefore, we would need a lot of time to go over most of the features of this uh, successful system. Um, but I will just fly over most of it uh, and um, I will be happy to take any questions and, and enhance the debate in the open session that we will have later um, in the day that uh, this will be shown. Um, so 
Um, let me start with some uh, basics uh, about the Cape Town Convention Treaty System. Um, this is um, generally um, a, a, one of the most uh, um, successful commercial treaties in history. It is designed to um, um, f uh, increase the availability and lower the cost of, of uh, financing and leasing um, uh, of uh, equipment of high value, uh, which is uniquely identifiable. Um, and and um, it is in, therefore a way to uh, try to ensure um, that the asset-based financing uh, is accessible uh, to everyone, uh, because asset-based financing does not uh, make uh, finance independent on the debtor, but rather uh, on the uh, value of the collateral. Uh, it is more accessible to um, to, uh, to borrowers in the market, and therefore enhances the scope and the possibility and likelihood of of uh, borrowers and, and, and uh, of, of possible enterprises wanting to access the market. Um, it was developed. Uh, almost 20 years ago uh, by the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, which, uh, as you know well, uh, has hopefully uh, has the uh, goes under the acronym of UNITRA, which is the international organization which I represent and which is soon to, uh, to turn 100 years old. Um, so um, the drafting of this uh, convention uh, which took place obviously in uh, in its final stage in the diplomatic conference that took place in, in Cape Town in South Africa uh, in 2001 um, was the result of many years of discussion and debate in, with the participation of some of the world's most prominent experts in uh, secured uh, credit, uh, secure financing and commercial law generally also uh, of the relevant industry um, which then was uh, mainly uh, consistent of the um, aircraft industry uh, and also uh, by government officials from basically all over the world. The um, Cape Town system uh, has a uh, basic architecture which I'd like you to see uh, here. Um, it is um, uh, a system of treaties which includes two types or two pieces or two tiers of, of legal uh, instruments. On the one hand, there is the um, general convention, uh, which is the main convention which provides uh, the uh, general framework and the core uniform rules. Uh, and uh, then there is a protocol covering different types of equipment which uh, fundamentally adapts and adjusts the uh, rules of the main convention to the specific characteristics of the different assets and, and, and the market. Um, and to date, we have four um, uh, conventions or um, protocols to the main convention. Uh, the first one, as I said before, was the aircraft protocol, which was approved in 2001, came into force in 2006, uh, which covers airframes, aircraft and engines, aircraft engines and helicopters, uh, and which, um, as we will see later, is an extremely successful instrument. Uh, after the aircraft, aircraft protocol, a few years later, in Luxembourg, Europe, the uh, rail protocol, the protocol rolling stock, uh, was approved. Um, this protocol is uh, now about to come into force. Uh, we are in the final stages with all the legal uh, infrastructure already in place. Um, and, and this is bound to be a deal, a game changer, uh, because it um, provides access to finance uh, to develop the railway industry. Railway, railway industry is now these days consider green energy, consider green means of transportation extremely efficient and therefore uh, most uh, regions of the world are betting strongly on the development of uh, rail track systems. Uh, this is the case in Asia, for example, through the Belt and Road Initiative. It is very much the case of the European region, with the European Commission strongly supporting the rail protocol. Uh, but it's also the case of Africa, for example, where the United Nations Economic Commission, the UNECA, has uh, strongly and repeatedly endorsed uh, 
uh, Cape Town uh, rail protocol with a view to try to connect all the cities, all the capital cities uh, of the African continent, which is a dream that would uh, be a complete a game changer for the development of the continent. Um, the, um, uh, way the, um, the, sorry, the, there's a space protocol which was uh, uh, um, approved in the diplomatic conference in Berlin two years later, and our most uh, recent baby, um, a bit less than today than a year ago, but. Uh, um, it was uh, approved in a diplomatic conference in Pretoria, uh, where we had uh, an extremely successful um, uh, conference where uh, um, the uh, protocol uh, resulting from that conference um, uh, meets all the needs of both the industry and the different governments interested in its development. And we are hopeful that uh, this um, treaty, which concerns mining, agriculture, and construction equipment, uh, will um, uh, help. Uh, especially developing and middle-income countries um, grow substantially by allowing access, cheap access to financing for uh, high-value machinery in those uh, key sectors of development, um, something which is not only favorable for developing countries and middle-income countries, but also for fully developed because it helps exports. Um, anyway, th these are the four protocols. The way the system works is there is a, the, 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 general the, the general treaty provides, as I said before, for the general framework, um, and then um, the uh, a specific type of equipment uh, provides for specific regulation, and this specific regulation um, overrules uh, the, uh, um, any co contradiction which might be apparent uh, between both texts in in, in reality, which is something which very, very rarely happens. Uh, of course, the interpretation of both pieces of legislation needs to be done jointly, as if it was one, just one system. It is important to reflect also that the Cape Town system is very flexible, and it, it gives countries the possibility to, um, um, uh, to uh, opt for certain declarations, and therefore to, for, uh, allows uh, countries to tailor uh, the um, uh, protocol uh, to the needs of the uh, a specific market in the country. Uh, so countries can modify some of the key aspects of the, of the treaty, um, and by doing that, uh, they can ensure it adapts best to the needs of their own market. Um, um, why Cape Town and its protocols? Um, the, the, the starting point what triggered uh, the, the negotiations at the onset was um, the, the uh, growing need for, uh, for financing of, uh, of uh, the construction and the acquisition and use of, of costly equipment, uh, uh, which is something which was especially uh, needed in the aircraft industry. Um, we have to think that air, aircrafts and all the, the other types of assets we mentioned, but especially aircrafts, are movable assets which uh, move obviously from, from country to country or might move from country to country and therefore uh, security rights uh, over uh, aircrafts um, um, could pose problems of legal certainty because uh, a security right um, constituted uh, based on the laws of country A might not be enforced in the laws of country B uh, where it will be moving and therefore that creates uncertainty. Uh, it weakens the strength of the um, um, secure, uh, security uh, right and, and therefore uh, makes credit uh, less available and more expensive. So there was a need to ensure there was a, a regulation which would cover the mobility of high value equipment changing from country to country. Um, um, how how um, would this uh, certainty be increased? Well, the um, increased certainty um, um, is achieved uh, by uh, creating um, the, 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 the parties to a security agreement or rotation of title uh, or leasing um, um, a transaction uh, 
the uh, creation of an uh, um, autonomous international interest, which is registered in an international registry, uh, which uh, is enforceable in all contracting states, and which provides for a very clear set of priorities and a very clear set of rules, uh, which is ex ante uh, considered as uh, um, adequate and uh, well known by creditors and therefore something they can rely on. So it enhances predictability in lending and that lowers the costs of uh, credit. Uh, the, as I said before, we are talking about a highly successful instrument, the Keaton Convention. You can see the world map here. Unfortunately, neither Korea nor Japan in the region are part of the Cape Town system, but the vast majority of the world is part of the Cape Town system. We are uh, at this stage talking about a situation where uh, we have 82 contracting states, uh, one regional organization, which is the European Union. Uh, and we have um, 79 contracting states only for aircraft. Uh, this uh, covers the majority of the world, both in terms of population and in terms of GDP. Uh, the uh, success of uh, the aircraft protocol uh, is measurable in, uh, in numbers very clearly. For example, uh, at the, only at the beginning of 2019, uh, I remember we were lucky to be invited to a party, a very special party in Dublin, Ireland, uh, where we celebrated together with the International Registry of the Aircraft Protocol, which is based there. Uh, uh, we celebrated a party to um, uh, commemorate the one millionth registration, uh, the one millionth transaction being registered um, uh, in, um, in the International Registry. Uh, and um, o o only then, uh, now the, the, the figure is well over that, obviously, but only then the estimated value of collateral uh, was already beyond 600 billion uh, US dollars. Um, the um, fact that um, Cape Town provides for a very um, uh, important um, effective mechanism to lower the cost of credit is not just uh, the assertion of the Secretary General of UNITRA, because you might think this guy is conflicted, uh, and I would be. The truth is that it's not us who say that, it's not only the numbers but also uh, a completely independent body, such as the uh, OECD. Uh, the OECD uh, has included what's called the Cape Town Discount, uh, which is uh, applicable to export credit agencies. Uh, this means basically that um, countries which are part of the Cape Town system uh, can uh, uh, have their export agencies finance uh, export transactions at a, low, a, low, a, a, a rate which is 10% lower uh, than that which they would need to charge in case they were not Cape Town. So just being Cape Town allows export agencies to charge 10% less, uh, and that is a lot. I have um, come up with a couple of examples, real life examples of the um, import, economic importance of the Cape Town discount. If we talk about financing of an aircraft, for example, a white body aircraft such as the one on the picture, uh, the um, average cost of such an aircraft would be in the tune of $140 million. Uh, and um, not it, um, infrequently, the um, transaction involving this type of aircraft, so either an acquisition or a lease, um, is financed uh, up to 85% of the, of the cost of the uh, of, man, uh, of, of acquisition of the aircraft. Well, uh, the, the percentage of risk category six as a standardized is 11.4, which means if we add this 10% uh, discount, uh, as uh, the OECD says we should, only for each aircraft, which is um, 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 subject to a transaction in one of the Cape Town countries, uh, for only, just for one aircraft, uh, about $1.3 million will be saved. Uh, the difference between um, um, the original transaction or the normal transaction and that uh, where you spare almost $1.5 million uh, is just the fact that your country is a Cape Town country. 
and this comes from a real life transaction. So that's the second one, which is uh, concerns the financing of um, of a transaction concerning a white a white body aircraft in the financial markets, in the capital markets. Uh, again, we are talking about 140 million cost of an aircraft. Uh, we are talking about financing 85 percent of it. Well. The best uh, uh, credit you can get to finance this, if you go to bank, to a bank to get a, de a loan um, um, based on variable uh, interest rates, would be the uh, London Index, the LIBOR, uh, plus 255 basic points. However, uh, if you apply the um, uh, keeps on discount, um, and, and this has been seen, for example, in the case of issuance of, of, of those bonds uh, of the American market, which are called Enhanced Equipment Trust Certificates, uh, the EETCs, um, the uh, resulting financing costs in reality drops to LIBOR plus 173 basic points. This means every airline which is financed in the uh, um, capital markets using Cape Town, or because it's a Cape Town country, uh, and saves over 6.5 million US dollars. Uh, so the, uh, if you multiply uh, that for as many aircrafts as an airline can have, you can only begin to imagine the uh, um, um, extraordinary savings that um, uh, export and import countries of this type of equipment can achieve only by being part of the Cape Town system. As I said, this is not our estimate. This is not our saying. This is the OECD's discount system. Um, what are the key legal features? I will fly over this because I think I'm approaching my time. Uh, the, uh, I mean, why is this working so well? What was the reason for this? Um, the reason basically is the following. On the one hand, uh, the system is based on the creation of an autonomous international interest or if you want an autonomous uh, secure transaction security right uh, which uh, the parties uh, create over equipment because as i said before it's asset-based uh, financing um, in, as i said before also it can concern different types of transactions is uh, a security right or a, se or a secure credit transaction is something very obvious to all of you but the same treatment exactly because this is a functional type of security right uh, applies to transactions in which there is a lease or a sale with retention of title. Those three cases are treated uh, exactly the same way in the convention or almost the same way uh, depending on the specificities. Um, the uh, autonomous international interest has to be registered in a 24-7 online registry uh, which is called the International Registry. Um, this is uh, the one uh, in place now um, is uh, for the aircraft protocol is located in Dublin, as I said before. It's a, a, um, um, a very functional, low cost, uh, excellently uh, run registry, which uh, is extremely transparent and allows for excellent predictability. Um, the information of what happens in that registry is available 24-7 and um, it is very uh, user-friendly. Um, so you would be amazed at how quick one can search uh, and, and get results or even register uh, a multi-million dollar transaction in an international registry with all the importance that that brings about, uh, as I said before, as I explained before. Um, so that autonomous interest, which is in, in, uh, registered in an international registry, uh, brings about strong enforceability. Means um, that the Cape Town Convention and its protocols uh, ensure um, even cross-border effectiveness uh, and enforcement of the uh, registered international interest in all the contracting states of Cape Town. So it doesn't matter where the asset is and where the asset comes from, so long as, it, as the borrower is from a Cape Town country, Cape Town applies and um, enforcement mechanisms will be uh, applicable uh, in a manner which is very efficient and cost effective. Uh, the the uh, system also provides very clear priority rules um, a very clear system of, of priorities um, with uh, a strong protection offered, of course, for the secured creditor or the lessor or the seller 
uh, on the retention of title um, in the uh, Cape Town system. Um, there are possible exceptions to the absolute priority of, of creditors, but they need to be predefined and predetermined by the government by way of declaration when they join um, the Cape Town uh, Convention. Um, more um, um, reasons why uh, the system is extremely successful is uh, the existence uh, and provision of cutting-edge, super-efficient system of enforcement um, uh, which um, usually um, better envisaged for secure transactions in local uh, domestic law systems. Um, the um, um, ability to sell collateral, to repossess collateral, to deregister an airplane so that it can no longer fly, all these uh, measures and default remedies, even um, for non-definitive, um, uh, judicially ascertained um, um, uh, bre breaches of contract, um, uh, interim uh, remedies uh, are extremely um, efficient and, uh, uh, and therefore provide strong certainty to creditors. That's why the whole transaction is done uh, at a lower cost. Uh, naturally, if enforcement is important, the most important part of all uh, is what happens with the um, security right in case of insolvency of the data. Um, um, naturally, for all secure transactions, uh, what, what, uh, how, how well the system is, how, how important the transaction is, and so, uh, um, how uh, resilient the, the right of the creditor is depends entirely on what happens when the debtor is no longer able to satisfy its debts in full generally. And that is when it matters. The Cape Town Convention system provides uh, different options, but um, especially one of them, option A, but also the rest in the case of uh, um, other protocols, um, with the exception of MAC, which only has option A. Uh, these are, um, uh, provides for a system which um, is uh, expedient, it's quick, it's reasonable, and it allows for enough protection to secure creditors within the insolvency procedure. Um, naturally, it will be up to the country to choose for one of the options in insolvency. Uh, this is uh, not a small choice for the government to make when they join Cape Town. If they choose an option which is less protective of the rights of creditors, then they will not benefit from the uh, um, OECD discount. Uh, the OECD discount works in case option A is chosen um, um, as the uh, law applicable in insolvency of the data. Um, I would love to go into much more detail um, but, uh, unfortunately, um, we have already, uh, I have already uh, used up a bit more than the time I was allocated. So, uh, um, I will um, cut it here uh, and um, I would like to uh, simply say that I remain fully available uh, to elaborate on any and all of the topics that I have brought forward here to all of you. Uh, that uh, I would be very happy to discuss all of this in um, the, uh, um, the, the time allocated for debate during this important international conference. Um, and uh, um, it only remains for me to, thanks, uh, to thank you all for your attention and to wish you uh, a good continuation of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tirado. Um, he explained the um, system of Cape Town Convention. And, and let's move on the UNSTRAL side. And the last speaker of in the morning session, um, he is Mr. Visit Visitora At. Um, he was um, he's um, a former judge, uh, currently the permanent secretary, Minister of Justice of Thailand. Um, he was also given a professorship from, Thai, uh, from 
uh, from Tamarasat University. So um, we, um, we, we expect uh, Mr. Vijit Sora Art. Are you there? Can you hear yeah. me? Okay, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Uh, I'm very glad to be invited to speak at this uh, conference and I thank the organizer for inviting me. Uh, I was asked to speak to you on three particular points. One is to explain roughly about the Uzi Chong and two, uh, touch upon the model laws on cross-border insolvency and insolvency related judgment. And then the third one would touch upon the uh, uh, security model law of the UNCTO. So I will read it all the link. Uh, this is quite a large topic, so I try to uh, stay to you on the very important point to make sure that I stay with the time limit. Uh, first, uh, for those of you who do not uh, familiar, who are not familiar with the UCTRO, I, I must uh, first explain to you that UCTRO is uh, an organization uh, at the commission level under the UN system. So in that regard, everything that UCTRO works uh, would have to be under the mandate of the UN. Uh, that would normally come up with the resolution of the UNTA. The Commission of UNCTRA was established with the aim to harmonize trade law. Uh, there are a lot of works that um, UNCTRA has produced to the world. Uh, you may already uh, receive that and, and, and apply that, uh, namely the arbitration, uh, the electric commerce. Uh, insolvency and secure transaction are another topics which are uh, something that I will touch upon today. The system of the UNCITRO works in this way. That is, the, uh, it starts off with the, with the Commission giving the mandate, and they have five, six working groups uh, to produce the work. Basically, the, uh, each working group will have the topic that they will uh, cover uh, by the mandate of the Commission. Uh, working group five and working group six deal with a topic that I will present today, that is the insolvency law. Sorry, the microphone was off. Can you hear me now? So I will, I will repeat it briefly uh, of what I said. UNCITRO is an organization under the UN system, and it, its mandate is to harmonize the trade law with the, with the intention that with, if we have the trade all over the world, the, it will produce peace in the world as well. Uh, UNCITRO is a commission level which uh, cover this mandate, and uh, it works in the way of create six working groups. This six working group cover the, the area of the commercial law. Um, uh, one would cover the arbitration, one would co cover the e electronic commerce, but uh, working group five and working group six would cover insolvency law and the secure transaction respectively. Uh, <clears throat> so if the working group have completed its work by way of um, uh, consulting with the members uh, of those who attend, uh, I would congratulate Korea and, and Japan also that they participate very actively in the working group and commission level. Um, uh, from, for 25 years that I worked at UNCTRO, I have made a lot of friends with Korea. Um, Professor Su Kin Oh and Professor Min Han represented in the working group five that I chair for 20, 20 years. Uh, and that say, say something about, about the way that uh, UNCTRO has a regional office in Korea. Uh, the, the work on insolvency law started very, very um, early. Uh, it started uh, in 1995. So if we look at the, the way that it started, uh, it started even before the economic crisis in, the, in, the, um, in Asia. So it, it, it started before for many, many, many years. So I think um, uh, it is an old product, but 
amazingly, it, it can be applied even nowadays. When we started the work on the uh, insolvency, I must say that um, uh, even Gerald Herman, who was the secretary of the UNCTRO at the time, uh, understand that insolvency law was part of the uh, insolvency li uh, impossible list. Uh, nobody uh, thought of or dare to deal with the harmonization of insolvency, but uh, the Modi law on cross for the insolvency started and uh, it proved that UNCTRO can do something about this. The reason that it become very, very difficult because uh, the work on insolvency law started and dealing with the court in each jurisdiction. So by way of um, harmonizing the procedures in many, many countries, it becomes something very, very difficult. Uh, the main organization that pushed through and helped the member states in dealing with that, this matter is well known in the world. Uh, one is the, the IBA and the, the other is the is INSO International. So I thank them for their effort in this work. I will explain briefly about the uh, cross border insolvency law. Um, the law itself is a model law, so it is not a convention. It is the package where the UNCTRO produced to the world that this part of the recommendation is a part of the, the, the law that you may adopt. There is no, no, no compulsory obligation if country would like to uh, adopt this law, uh, they would have to uh, translate it and, 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 and make, make sure that it moves through that its own uh, parliamentary jurisdiction and become its own law. It's not like a convention that you have to adopt every word, every concept. The more the law is different, you can adopt part of it. Uh, you, can, uh, you can amend some part of it or even modify but to make sure that the general concept is there, then it is up to each country. The model law on cross border insolvency, basically, uh, if you look at the main concept, it is very straightforward because it started very early. One, is, one, of, one, one main concept is that it is not dealing with the conflict of law. So basically, the rule on conflict of law will depend on each country conflict of law rules. Uh, it only tell the procedures where the court in each country will decide on the case and cooperate in order to make sure that the insolvency in one jurisdiction may be recognized and enforced in the other jurisdiction. Uh, what I would like to point out in this part is that if you want to understand this, the concept of the insolvency uh, on crops and insolvency, just imagine the concept where uh, you have uh, different jurisdictions and then uh, with the trade nowadays, you have different uh, creditors in different jurisdictions and the same data may be located in different ju jurisdictions as well. So. Uh, in the past, if we look at the concept of the territoriality where the law of, of insolvency in, in, in many countries would limit the work of insolvency in each jurisdiction, and that would become very difficult because you will have multiple uh, proceedings of insolvency if that debtor is somehow subject to insolvency. The concept of the crossword insolvency is to uh, 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 suggest and, and recommend that uh, each country will move to a new concept that is the universality where you shouldn't stop or limit the scope of insolvency law in your country only. You can actually go through uh, the assets and dealing with the credit or creditors in different countries. So the concept of universality uh, uh, actually adopted, but not in full, but uh, the concept, if you look at that, there is a first recommendation uh, in that cross border insolvency uh, model law that if you adopt this law, you should open up the jurisdiction. Uh, and that is part where you start with the concept of the access. Uh, I would have to ask my my 
my my my my uh, assistant to open the the slide. Please go to the um, crossword insolvency. To the model law. Please go on. Okay. The four elements, or the four elements of the model law on crossroad insolvency, and if you look at this and, and imagine that you have the system where you um, uh, have the same debtor in different countries, and you have the creditor from different countries, and that if you have the insolvency start with the, the same debtor, you will have to deal with the multiple uh, proceedings by commence the proceedings of insolvency in different, in different jurisdictions. So the idea is to limit that. And by the way of limiting that and not going to the details of the conflict of law, this is the recommendations of the model law that you may adopt in your country. First, the, the concept of access. The idea of the concept of access is very simple. It applies where if the countries have the territorial approach, uh, you should change it. You should allow the, uh, your representative in insolvency, it could be obviously receiver, it could be the debtor itself in possession, to be able to go out of your country and apply uh, his power or her power in another jurisdiction. So access is very simple in a way that um, would allow the, each country to go to the other countries. And that is the first basic part of the access rule. But the main concept of that would be on the recognition itself. So if you have the jurisdiction, if one jurisdiction commence the proceeding of insolvency in one jurisdiction, the idea of the model law is to allow you to go out. And then in the model law itself, would give the provision that the receiving country, if you have that kind of law, would allow the court to recognize and help the jurisdiction that come to your country. So in terms of recognition, uh, the law provides some simple rules that instead of filing the commencement of insolvency, going for the whole process of the new case. Uh, you should just apply to the court and tell the court in the receiving end that the proceeding of insolvency has already started and commenced in, the, uh, in your country and provide the proof of that. If, if, that, is, if that is the case, uh, the model law would ask the court in the receiving end to give the recognition status and uh, the recognition status would give the court the power to help and um, by way of dealing with this um, that is a, a, a trick issue where the model law adopted the concept of the European uh, uh, insolvency law where you have the country that you will help best and the country that you will just assist. To tell the difference of the countries that you should help best, uh, the model law adopt the concept that the same that uh, even though they have the different locations of their business, there is normally one jurisdiction that will be the one that should have the control of the same debt, uh, and we call that the center of the main interest of the debtor. And, and, and in, in terms of that, the model law does not define the concept of the uh, center of main interest, or in short, we call it COMI. Uh, so it depends on the receiving end court to uh, give, the, give the decision. However, uh, the way of looking at the COMI is very, is very universal. 
you look at the way that the head office or maybe the, the center of the control of the, the company itself that located in that jurisdiction. So if the court uh, see that the, the relief that was asked by the, 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 the jurisdiction where the debtor has the COMI, uh, the model law will tell you that you should give the uh, assistance or the relief to the point where you should assist them best. But if the, 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 the assistant was asked by the country where the jurisdiction does not have the comey of the debtor, uh, the assistant may be subject to the um, uh, discretion of the court. Uh, the only difference between the recognition of the jurisdiction with the comey and the jurisdiction without the comey uh, is only that you uh, uh, will not have the automatic stay uh, if the, you give the relief to the country without the, um, the COMI of the debtor. So, in a way, uh, this is a part where many countries is quite hesitant, but um, in fact, if you look at the model law on the recognition, uh, the country that adopt the model law would provide the protection of the local uh, creditors by way of giving the protection by the court. So I think um, the border law is, is quite balanced in, 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 in there. And, and apart from that, if you look at the model law on cross border insolvency, you also see some other part where it gives you some rules because in some particular part, you may have different proceedings in different jurisdictions. And there may be the situation where the creditors that go to some countries and will go to ask for the proof of claim in another countries, there would be the rules on the, um, the sharing of assets and that would be subject to the uh, part of the concurrent proceedings in the, in the chapter 5. And um, the model law also try to encourage that countries would speak to each countries more uh, so that would be part of the chapter four in the cooperation and coordination and ask the court to communicate in the different countries. Uh, in short, I would say that uh, the model law of the uh, cross border insolvency is to create a, a mechanism where uh, if you want to help and make sure that that is less uh, the proceedings and, and your creditors can go out and then to apply for insolvency abroad. This is a mechanism that will help. Uh, model law, this model law has been in force for, for quite a while. And uh, if you look through the website of the UNCITROL, you can see that there are quite a number of, the, of, of countries uh, in, in, in Asia and also in, in other continents adopted this model law. Unfortunately, Thailand has not adopted it yet. We have a draft legislation, but uh, due to some um, difficulties, uh, we are trying to resolve that, but uh, we in principle agree with this model law. Uh, you may have another question of, of the, the topic, why? Why we have the model law on crossword insolvency that apply, and then why do we have another model law that um, dealing with the insolvency related judgment? Uh, this can be explained in short. Uh, the model on crossroad insolvency, when was, it, was, it was recommended by the UNGA and adopted by many countries, we thought that it would not create any problem because uh, when you go from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction, if they adopted the model law, they would give the assistance through the mechanism that we, we allow in the model law itself. The problem is, when you apply the concept of the border law, the interpretation of, of the law itself would be subject to the, each jurisdiction. It is a, it's not like when you have the uh, convention, you have uh, the way of controlling the interpretation, but when you apply the model law with a different um, uh, uh, jurisdiction, uh, idea, the system, you may come up with the different interpretation. Uh, if you are familiar with the insolvency 
proceeding, you understand that insolvency proceeding deal with the estate, and the proceeding itself uh, will subject to the court in each jurisdiction. And the insolvency court normally have the power to deal with the estate. Uh, in many ways that you deal with the estate, uh, for those who work with insolvency would understand well that there could be many disputes. Uh, for example, uh, the dispute may be something dealing with the asset of the debtor itself uh, because some of the transaction of the uh, debtors may be done and may be required to have the, it revoked by the court because it may be against the fraudulent transfer or maybe something that the debtor may have the difficulties because the debtor of the debtor did not perform the performance under the law in that jurisdiction. So the debtor may have to file the case against the debtor of the debtors. And that, if you work with the insolvency, you know, we would call it like, like uh, the arms of the proceedings. Uh, that would be the part of the main proceeding in each jurisdiction. Uh, the first rules that we have on the model law on cause and insolvency did not this differentiate between the main proceedings of the, the insolvency itself and the um, secondary or the, uh, the details of the cases or the small cases. Uh, and we, we thought that in, in, in every jurisdiction, they would adopt the same approach. But the problem arose when some main jurisdiction in the world interpret that model law and cause of insolvency may not cover insolvency related judgment, i.e. those cases that I have explained to you. So it becomes the problem because you do, you do not have, have, you will have a lot of issues if uh, you, if the court in the jurisdiction did not interpret the MLCBI in a way to cover and give the relief uh, in that particular part. So in this particular part, the model law on insolvency related judgment was formed. And then if you look at it, it's very simple. If the court in, ju in your jurisdiction have the approach of interpret the model on crossword insolvency in a very wide way, you do not need it. But if there is a restriction, interpretation, or maybe the risk of not interpret in, the, in a wide way, you would require to adopt this insolvency judgment related uh, model law. Uh, I will go to the last model law on the secure transaction uh, uh, as quickly as I can. Uh, the intention is very simple, and that happened to Thailand too. That is, if you want the credit, you want the cheap credit, and to make sure that if the security law in your country works very well, you will uh, have the cheap credit uh, in, in your country, and that will help the, the economy. The problem is, in many, many countries, uh, the system of security is limited to only mortgage and pledges. Uh, many countries understand the mortgage apply to the situation of immovable property where those would be registration to work on that. And then the, for the pledges, you work with the movable property where you have to surrender the uh, property, movable property to the, uh, to the creditor. But this way of, of dealing with that is to ensure that you have the system where you can, you can put a lot of movable property, tangible and intangible, as the secure as a, sec, as a security. How to do that? The model law give you this the, the very simple idea that if you want to put those in the as a security, you start having the different system of the registry. Uh, the registry is is a simple way that you can place by way of definition and put those in the security system. Uh, so under the model law, you can put many things that may not be available in, the, in your uh, old system in, in this. So those 
intangible, for example, uh, receivables or those tangible that you require to work in your company, like inventories, would be something that uh, not, do not require the pledge or change it into the document so that you can pledge the document. So the system of the, the model law uh, is simple in a way, but they are very much in detail. The detail is very simple in a way that they give you some ideas of the competition of the system and also the conflict of laws that you, you have to understand that receivables are something that intangible, so it requires you to go through um, uh, some different countries that you require this conflict of law. Uh, I would suggest that if, if your country require the, to move to that, this model laws, this three model laws are something that worth considering and understand that uh, we'll have to debate on this uh, at the later stage. Uh, I will not be able to debate with you, but um, uh, my understanding is that the representative of the UNSTRO will be with you. Thank you very much. Kamsamida. Uh, Thank you, Professor Vijit Victoria Ed. Um, see you in the afternoon discussion session at real time. Mm. So with this, um, the morning session is now adjourned. Um, thank you for the participation, attention, and all your patience. See you in the afternoon. See you in the afternoon. Mm, stay tuned. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I appreciate all speakers of session two for giving us an instructive overview of complicated issues on the secure transaction and insolvency. This brings us to the end of the second session, and now luncheon will be served here at the Grand Balloon. The afternoon session will begin at 2.30 p.m. Until then, please enjoy your lunch. Thank you. <laughs>